Psychoanalytic Theory It is our hope that after viewing our presentation on psychoanalytic theory, you will have gained the knowledge regarding its original founder, key assumptions surrounding his theory, and how it continues to resonate into society to this day. Sigmund Freud was born in 1856 and died 83 years later in 1939. He is considered by many to have had the most profound influence on personality theory. This quote by him clearly states his belief that everything you need to know about your personality comes from within. His quote says, turn your eyes inward, look into your own depths, learn to first know yourself. Sigmund Freud was born in Moravia. We know this today as the Czech Republic. His father was a poor, incredibly strict wolf merchant who at the time of Sigmund's birth was married to a woman half his age. When Sigmund turned four, following the inability of his parents to make ends meet, they moved to Austria. From a very young age, Sigmund acquired an incredible dislike for his father, while at the same time falling in love with his mother. She treated him with kids' gloves, often referring to him as the Golden Siggy. He was given special treatment with his own room and special lighting in order to foster his intellect. By 12, he was fluent in six languages, was documenting his dreams, and knew for certain with sure confidence that he was destined for greatness. In 1873, Freud entered medical school at the University of Vienna, and while he was attending, he conducted medical research on anatomy and the nervous system. Unfortunately, he began researching cocaine while at the same time indoctrinating it into his own life. This led to much criticism by colleagues and left a dark stain on his credibility and reputation. Around the mid-1880s, he came in contact with Chaka, who put hysterical patients under hypnosis to try to unlock experiences that may have contributed to their hysteria. It would be this connection and his clinical research with patients experiencing emotional disorder that would lead Freud on a lifelong journey of psychoanalysis. Psycho what? Let's take a moment to do a little clarifying of terms. Psychoanalytic. That's Sigmund Freud's theory of personality. Psychoanalysis. This is Freud's theory of personality and system of therapy for treating mental disorders, and psychodynamic. This includes Freud's theories and those of his followers. Psychoanalysis was the first formal theory of personality and is still very popular today. The assumptions of psychoanalytic theory are the following. Basic instincts, levels of personality, structure of personality, anxiety, defenses against anxiety, psychosexual stages of personality development, and we'll take a closer look at all of these assumptions throughout this presentation. Assumption one, these are our basic instincts. Um, according to Freud, these are the basic elements of our personality, the motivating forces that drive behavior and determine its direction. Um, mental representations of internal stimuli, such as hunger, that drive a person to take certain action. The, the aim, basically, of instinct is to satisfy needs in order to reduce tensions within us. Um, we always experience a certain amount of instinctual tension, and we're always trying to reduce it. Um, this is also known as tribal which is best translated as a driving force or impulse. Um, it basically, this transformed physiological energy that connects the body's needs with the mind's wishes. There's two basic types of instincts. You have your life instincts and your death instincts. Um, your life instincts are that drive to satisfy needs for food, water, air, sex. You may have heard the term libido. This is that um, drive that a person has toward pleasurable behaviors and thoughts. On the other end of the spectrum are the death instincts. And these are derived from the unconscious and are focused on destruction and aggression. Um, 
that that compulsion to destroy and conquer uh, would be related to death instincts. Second assumption are the levels of personality. Freud's original conception divided personality into three levels, the conscious, the preconscious, and the unconscious. Uh, the conscious includes all the sensations and experiences of which we are aware at any given moment. Um, the preconscious is that, that storehouse of memories, those perceptions and thoughts um, that we're not necessarily of, aware of at the moment, but we can find our attention shifting back and forth from experiences of the moment to events and memories. And then the unconscious contains that major driving power behind all behaviors and is the um, repository of forces that we can't see or control. Assumption three, this is the structure of the personality. You, know, you may have heard it referred to as the psyche. And it, it's divided into three, three structures, the id, the ego, and the, the superego. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the id. The id supplies all the energy for the other two structures, that is the ego and the superego. So basically the id operates according to the pleasure principle. Uh, whatever it wants, it, it wants. And the pleasure, the pleasure principle is the principle by which the ID functions to avoid pain and maximize pleasure. Um, it's related to the original unconscious level of our personality. While the id is well below the surface of awareness and is difficult to retrieve material from, it is also the primary process thinking. So the id has no awareness of reality and drives us to want what we want, when we want it, regardless of what anyone else wants. One way to think of the id is, is as a newborn baby who cries and waves its fists when, it, when its needs aren't met, but has no idea of how to bring about that satisfaction. Um, and then the next you go into the ego. This is kind of the mediator between the id and the, the superego. So the ego, the characteristics include reason and rationality. And those are obtained after developing the powers of perception and judgment and such. It determines the appropriate and socially acceptable times and places and objects that will satisfy the id impulse. In other words, it'll give the id some things that it wants as long as it's okay with society. Uh, the reality principle under which it operates is the principle by which the ego functions to provide appropriate constraints on the expression of the id's instincts. And then you have the superego. The superego consists of two parts. Um, our conscious, which contains behaviors for which the child has been punished, and the ego ideal, which contains the moral or ideal behaviors for which a person, a person should strive. So I kind of think of the superego as the ultra parent. Um, it's going to ultimately put a, a kibosh on anything that the id wants, but the ego might try to mediate that a bit. So Freud uses the iceberg as a way to best depict those levels and structures of personality, which I think is is really beneficial um, as, as an image, as, as a visual. And as you can tell from the pictures, um, our conscious is relatively small. It's that tip of the iceberg that sticks out over the water um, compared to what goes on mentally below the surface, which would be more of the, the id and the superego and the ego. The fourth assumption is, is relating to anxiety. And anxiety is a feeling of fear and dread without an obvious cause, while reality anxiety is a fear of tangible dangers. So reality anxiety would be something like a hurricane or an earthquake, something like that. That's a, that's a real anxiety, a real thing to be fearful of. Neurotic anxiety involves a conflict between the id and the ego. Uh, so its basis is in childhood and its conflict between that instinctual gratif gratification and what in reality can actually be done. And then moral anxiety is a conflict between the id and the superego. So this is a fear of one's conscience. And this is the ultimate, the fundamental um, anxiety that leads to neurotic or psychotic behavior. The fifth assumption are those defenses that we use against anxiety. How do we, how do we cope? And a lot of these I'm sure you've heard of, but... Um, Anxiety is a signal that, you know, there's impending danger, a threat to the ego that must be counteracted or avoided. 
And in order for the ego to reduce this conflict between the demands and the id and the, the structures of society or the superego, it's come up with these, these defenses. And Freud noted that we, we rarely use just one of these defenses. We typically defend ourselves against anxiety using several of these defenses at the same time. So just to kind of point out a couple of them, denial, uh, projection, regression, uh, rationalization, uh, ex making reasons for why, why we have anxiety to, in order to, be, to accept it, displacement and sublimation. The sixth assumption gets lots of attention, always has. Uh, this is the psychosexual stages of personality development. And to be physiologically healthy, we must successfully complete each stage, according to Freud. Uh, mental abnormality can occur if a stage is not completed successfully, and the person becomes fixated in, let's say, a particular stage. Um, this particular theory shows how adult personality is determined by childhood experiences. And according to Freud, usually this should be completed by the fifth year of your life. And Freud sensed that conflicts seem to resolve around or revolve around certain areas of the body. So, for example, in the oral stage, pleasure is derived from sucking on things. The anal stage, this is when um, children aren't getting that usual, usual gratification from going to the bathroom because they're trying to hold it until they get to the toilet during toilet training. Um, the phallic stage, um, this centers around curiosity about the genital area and fantasies about marrying a parent. Um, the latent, uh, latent stage is a time of little sexual interest, kind of between five and puberty, when you have really no interest or motivation in anything sex sexually related. And finally, there's the genital stage, and this is when you're at your sexual identity is becoming more clear, and you know you're starting to form adult relationships. This slide demonstrates the cause and effect on adult personality. So, for example, I think this is really interesting. An adult who experiences perhaps forceful feeding in that oral stage or deprivation of food or maybe weaned too early from their parent um, it, during that oral stage, they might remain fixated on behaviors that are oral in nature. So think of smoking or overeating or, or, or something along those lines. The seventh assumption um, is kind of an assessment of Freud's theory. So free association, um, although Freud initially used hypnosis to some success, he later had patients lie on a couch. You might have seen the image on the first screen of our, our presentation. That, that comes from Freud's time. And he would sit behind the couch and uh, out of the sight of the patient and have them recall things and just talk out loud, basically kind of like oral daydreaming. And then Freud would later document the things that the patients would, would reveal. Dream analysis was another technique. Uh, Freud distinguished between manifest content, which is actual events in the dream, and latent content, so the more symbolic meanings, the images in the dream. And interestingly, a survey of psychoanalysts in 2008 found that the majority of them believed in the values of dream, dreams for understanding the problems that their patients experienced. So that is still something that is around today. The influence of psychoanalytics in the field of psychology and society. Sigmund Freud changed the way the world thinks and understands about human behavior. He set the foundation for many theorists to either build or oppose his work by being the first to investigate the theory of the unconscious mind and how it may influence human behavior. Because of this, he is also known as the founding father of psychoanalysis. Although his therapeutic technique has declined mainly in the United States, it is becoming popular in China. Not only has his work influenced the field of psychology, but many other areas too. The unconscious mind. Years after Freud's death, researchers have been able to experiment and learn more about human behavior using many of Freud's concepts and work. The theory of unconscious mind was one of those experimented on. The concept of the unconscious mind is important in psychoanalysis because it is Freud's assumption that the unconscious mind governs the conscious thought and human behavior. Contemporary researchers have based their studies on the basis of Freud's theory of the unconscious mind. 
and most have come to an agreement that much functioning occurs without conscious choices, and that some of our behavior occurs in opposition to what is consciously desired. The research on the nature of the unconscious involves subliminal perception. Stimuli are presented to research participants below their level of conscious awareness. Despite their inability to perceive the stimuli, the research participants' conscious processes and behavior are activated by the stimuli. People can be influenced by this, of which they are not consciously aware. This is one example of how the theory of the unconscious mind helps develop the therapeutic process for psychodynamic therapy, which can be used to treat patients and help them quit smoking and drinking, become more assertive, and perhaps even eat healthier. This is actually used quite often in our everyday lives. Uh, retailers are doing this all the time. For example, they encode messages into music that encourage people to spend more money. And whether or not subliminal messages actually work we can see that this has spurred a $50 million industry. So something to be aware of for sure. Understanding dreams was another important concept in understanding behavior. Although researchers have experimented and confirmed that dreams in disguise or symbolic form reflect emotional concerns, they do not support the idea that dreams represent fulfillment wishes or desires. Uh, there's been some studies done recently, for example, studies of Kurdish and Palestinian children who are exposed to physical danger in their everyday lives show that they dream about more threatening and traumatic situations than other children that are living in more peaceful surroundings. Um, also, we see uh, with more continued access to electronic media, uh, studies are showing that spending a great deal of time for example, playing video games um, leads to having more bizarre dreams containing dead and um, imaginary characters. So Freud's technique of dream analysis has changed the way society views how important dreams really are, and it can help us understand how dreams might actually reflect our personality and emotions. Even though many researchers debate on Freud's work on psychoanalytic theory, his work is still used widely as either a foundation to build from or to develop other viewpoints opposing it. Psychoanalysis has opened doors to some part of psychology where researchers never thought were important. It helped people to understand more on the mind and the behavior.